Enki versus Gilgamesh. The most famous Sumerian gods, Enki and Gilgamesh. Enki, who was alternately named Ea, Enkik, Ninsiku, and Nudimud, was one of the primary gods in the Sumerian pantheon. He was in control of fresh water, wisdom and intelligence, mischief, magic, creation, fertility and virility, healing, handcrafts and art. Most of the artistic depictions of him show him as an old man with a long beard, a horned hat and rich robes. He is climbing a majestic mountain with the sun rising over it, while clear water runs from his arms and symbolic trees decorate his path. The trees indicate the masculine and feminine sides of existence. The streams of water represent the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Enki is loosely translated as Lord of the Earth. He began his existence as a god in Sumer, focused solely on fresh water and was closely associated with the city of Eridu. This demonstrated his supreme importance because all life comes from the water and that particular city was considered the first one ever created. The earliest mentions of Enki showed up around 2600 BCE, during the early dynastic period, Ila. He was reimagined as Ea by the Akkadians approximately 200 years later. Archaeological explorations, however, found some evidence of smaller shrines to the original water god as far back as 5000 BCE. His different purposes and names journeyed with him through a variety of cities and empires. Enki's origin and offspring. Anu, the god of the sky for both Akkadian and Sumerian religious worship, was given as Enki's father in those cultures. In Babylonian stories, his father was considered Apsu, who created existence itself, and his mother was Namu, who gave birth to the earth and the sky. Enki was weighed to Ninmar, and they bore Asaluhi, god of magic, Enbilulu, god of canals, Marduk, the king of all gods, and a dapper, who was a human wise man. According to the myth about Enki and Ninhusag, the god also sired eight additional children with her. These included Abu, god of plants, Nintula, the god of precious metal, Ninsitu, goddess of healing, Ninkasi, the goddess of beer, Nanshe, the goddess of justice and divination, Azimur, another goddess of healing and wife of the god of the underworld, Emshak, god of fertility, and Ninti, the goddess who was considered the giver of life. Enki was frequently said to be the father of Inanna, a very popular goddess of fertility, love, sexuality, and war. This very productive god showed up in a wealth of legends and myths with his wife or one or more of his offspring at his side. These include inscriptions specifically created for various kings, throughout the years, and those written creatively by literary experts and scribes of the time. In general, the main themes seem to be the creation of the world and people, and stories of Marduk specifically and his battle against chaos. Enki also features in the famous Epic of Gilgamesh. The Enuma Elish Origin Story Written around 1100 BCE, the Babylonian story called Enuma Elish 
features Enki as the son of the primordial gods, existed since the beginning of time. The origin of everything started with the masculine existence of fresh water called Apsu, and the feminine existence of salt water called Tiamat. As they came together, they created the earliest seven gods and goddesses together. Unfortunately, these young deities were exceptionally noisy, bothered Apsu so much while he was trying to sleep, that he decided to destroy all of them. Tiamat, being the doting mother, she found this idea horrific and warned Enki about his father's plans. To thwart the impending murder, he was able to kill Apsu after he fell asleep. Tiamat became equally horrified that her son would do such a thing to her husband and immediately disowned all of their children, created a demonic army, got her consort, Quingu, to leave them and sent them against Enki and the other early gods. This is where Marduk, son of Enki, stepped in. In exchange for his might and leadership skills, he insisted that he could lead the holy army against the demonic horde and destroy them. Instead of the younger gods taking turns as the leader and failing every time, they decided to take this new opportunity and elected Marduk as the king. He was able to destroy Quingu, shoot Tiamat with a magical arrow that divided her into two pieces, which would ultimately become the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. The remaining parts of her body became the land masses of the earth. The gods all got together and used Quingu's remains to fashion the first people. Although Marduk did most of the action surrounding the origin of the world and humans, he asked Enki how to do things and for his blessing throughout the entire process. Therefore, Enki is usually considered the creator god. The Atrahasis of Babylon and Akkad Sometime in the 1600s BCE, another creation story called the Atrahasis was written. While the exact process of creation of the world and people were considerably different, it was still Enki who was considered the top god and orchestrator of it all. It all starts with a description of the older gods lazing about and doing nothing, while the younger ones must struggle day in and day out to maintain the world that was created. They cannot rest or take a break. Enki brings up the great idea to create a race of beings subservient to them who could do the work instead. However, they cannot figure out how to make them until one of the gods named Wellu decides to sacrifice himself for the formative physical materials the goddess Ninhusag transforms his body and blood into a type of pottery clay, with which she forms seven men and seven women. They procreate readily and fill the land with thousands of people, doing the work for the gods and goddesses. At first this seems like a very good thing. The younger gods do not have to toil all day anymore. However, so many people are born that they make so much noise and are so active that it disturbs Enlil, the father god, and makes it difficult for him to relax and enjoy his leisure time activities. So he sends a few plagues, including droughts, famines and pestilence, across the land to kill many people so they are quieter. Enki takes pity on the people and gives them instructions about how they can stop all these problems and restore balance once more. Enlil notices that his plagues are not having the desired effect at minimising the number of people on earth anymore. They just keep multiplying. After much discussion with the other high gods, he sends a massive worldwide flood across the world in order to destroy all life that the younger gods created. Enki tries to stop him, but in the end he is unsuccessful. Therefore he journeys down to earth and tells a man named Atrahasis, who will become the inspiration for Noah in the Christian Bible, to build a massive ship for his family and many animals. When the Great Flood comes, he and his family alone are saved. Both the people and the lesser gods are distraught over so much death and destruction. They cry and beg Enlil to stop this horrific idea, but he does not realize the folly of his ways until everyone is dead. The Flood retreats to reveal that Atrahasis survived because of Enki's warning. He and the animals emerge from the ship, and he and his family worshipped the gods and make sacrifices to appease them. Enlil is both impressed at the man's piety and severely angry that Enki defied him by telling one human how to escape his wrath. Eventually Enlil calms down 
and the gods decide to create a new type of being that will not populate the earth as quickly as the one sacred before. In order to control the population, they create less fertile people, allow demons to carry babies away, make some of the women miscarry, and other women perpetually virginal because they were claimed by the gods. The lifespan of human beings was also minimized, and the risks increased. While Enki seems to be on the side of humanity in these stories, he was also doing a lot of beneficial things for other gods and goddesses, both in his direct lineage and outside of it. For example, he helps the god of destruction, Nergal, remain outside of the underworld for half of every year. He also arranges for his daughter Inanna's rescue from the netherworld after her death. Throughout various tales and legends, he is usually shown as a very wise and cunning god who can figure out the solutions to a diverse range of problems. He is dedicated to his family, especially Inanna, and frequently helps to restore balance to situations that seem generally out of control. One example of this comes from the poem, The Descent of Inanna. Ultimately, she is saved from death and is given various understandings and gifts that she can do so on humanity. Enki makes choices that are seemingly against what the other gods desire, and he is temporarily considered a trickster in these stories. However, it is generally shown by the end that he has a considerably enlightened outlook and takes actions based on the result. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, he allows Enkidu to get killed, for example. When Inanna tries to seduce Gilgamesh and is rebuffed, Enki protects his daughter's ego by allowing the Bull of Heaven to destroy him. While this does not originally sound like something that Enki would allow for such an epic and heroic figure as Gilgamesh, the end result justifies the means. He recognizes that Gilgamesh will therefore learn about loss in such a way as to affect his understanding of life in general and how to live a good one. Enki is generally considered a sympathetic character in the tales he appears in, even when his actions seem morally challenging. In the story of Enki and Ninhusag, he attempts to seduce his daughter because she looks so much like his wife. He accepts his punishments, but is not revealed in an exceptionally bad light, the cause of an enchantment that forced him to view his daughters as his wife because of great sorrow and a sense of loss. In other words, despite his negative actions, he is forgiven mostly due to outside influences. The seeming protection that he has against fault combines with his wisdom and sometimes tricky attitude toward achieving the best outcome. Worship of Enki as the Patron of Eridu Eridu was largely considered the first city on earth. Enki was therefore adopted as the patron god of this city. It was first created around 5400 BCE and would stand strong as a political, religious and commerce area for thousands of years. It features heavily in tales and legends stretching from Mesopotamia all the way through the Hebrew creation of the Old Testament and beyond. When archaeologists and researchers reached Eridu, many millennia after its founding, they were surprised to find a large number of shrines dedicated to Enki that had been in use for centuries. In fact, some of the earliest ones were constructed and augmented or rebuilt for over 1,000 years. During all of this time, Enki had become an exceptionally popular god outside of the city as well. Nevertheless, Eridu remained his essential home and hub of worship. He was associated with subterranean fresh water that flowed in this region. The temples of Enki were controlled by an entire network of priests who did a variety of tasks associated with shrine maintenance, worship, acceptance, and use of sacrifices, healing, and public care. When it came to things like food distribution and serving the poor, they did not hold regular ceremonial services, but did organize festivals and special events. The people who lived in the city would have private services or offer prayers to Enki on their own. Enki was so much more than protector of the city and ruler of the subterranean waters. Because he was one of the high gods that existed since virtually the beginning of time, people found him considerably important in a variety of ways. Therefore, they attributed to him a host of powers that attracted a variety of creatures and beings into his service. These would include giants, mermaids and mermen, demons and more. 
representative as they were of the towering heights of civilization at the time, and see deep dark depths of reality. Enki was considered a source of universal wisdom and protection. He was ultimately a very human-focused god, who used his power for the benefit of people rather than for his own whims. The Epic of Gilgamesh Commonly considered one of the first pieces of fictional literature in the world, the Epic of Gilgamesh has influenced many later stories and writers. Knowing this today, it may come as a surprise that the story was lost for the majority of the time it existed. Around 1612 BCE, the Medes and Babylonians attacked the Assyrian Empire, destroyed many of its cities, including Nineveh, and took over the land. Nineveh had been considered the capital of the empire at that time and had an extensive library full of clay tablets upon which were written all the stories collected from the civilization. Despite the Babylonians attempting to destroy it all by fire, the clay tablets were simply baked instead of ruined. Although they failed to get rid of all this literature and records, the building did collapse on top of them and buried them all for thousands of years. They were finally unearthed again in the mid-1800s, when European explorers started their archaeological digs. The goal of these early historians, researchers and representatives of museums and governments was to prove biblical stories from the Old Testament. The Christian holy book did mention many of the rulers and cities from the Mesopotamian civilization, so the people in power believe that there must be other stories of these great times buried in the ruins. Excavations took years, and many interesting artifacts were found. The interest in discovering biblical evidence ramped up considerably when Charles Darwin published his scientific treaty used in 1859 CE. Interestingly enough, the researchers did not discover what they were looking for. Instead of locating proof that the biblical stories were original and true, they found evidence that most of them had been borrowed from earlier tales. The things that Christians believed, such as the story of the Garden of Eden and Noah's Ark, were not ultimately a part of that religion at all. Instead, they came from the pantheistic beliefs of the Sumerian people. They were derived from the legends and myths of a society that the Christian believers would have denounced as ungodly due to their beliefs in multiple gods and goddesses, and how the entire realm of spirituality functioned. When the library of clay tablets in what was Nineveh was first discovered, it showed the world that the Christian Bible was not the source of all literary information about how the world was created or how their singular God ruled over it. Instead, the earliest civilization on earth already had many of the innovations, literature styles, agricultural advancements, technologies, and belief systems in place that were later attributed to others. For example, many people believe that Homer the great Greek literary expert, was the father of the heroic epic tale. He created his stories around 800 BCE. With the finding of the clay tablets from Mesopotamia, it became obvious that this form of writing was around for hundreds if not thousands of years before then. Austin Henry Layard brought the Epic of Gilgamesh to light in 1849 CE. While there were multiple formats of this story, the most complete one was written in Akkadian and covered 12 tablets buried under the fallen library building in what had been Ashurbanipal. The Epic of Gilgamesh Story On 11 of the 12 tablets, historians could decipher the now well-known tale about Gilgamesh. The 12th tablet has an alternative form of the story in which a man named Bilgamesh, which had been an accepted form of Gilgamesh according to other archaeological finds, journeyed to the netherworld in a different way. In most cases, the first 11 tablets are taken as the bulk of the story that was written all at the same time. The whole thing started as an epic poem in Sumer. The scribes later translated it into Akkadian. The original name for the story was He Who Saw the Deep, or Surpassing All Other Kings. The original writing occurred anywhere from 700 to 1,000 years after King Uruk reigned. It was said to have been the story about him specifically. There were earlier stories about the same character who was described as a human hero and a demigod, who was related to Inanna, 
one of the highest goddesses in the Mesopotamian pantheon. Although the human equivalent of Gilgamesh is not sufficiently precise, it is obvious to researchers that he was a powerful symbol of humanity in general. His epic might was considerably tempered by the types of struggles that everyday people had to go through. These included loss, death, and existential dread. The man who wrote the Epic of Gilgamesh was named Sin Leki Unini, or Moon God, accept my plea. He lived somewhere in the period between 1300 and 1000 BCE, and is considered one of the first literary writers in the world. He is also considered the originator of the heroic epic form of story, more so than other writers who came before him. He was by some considered a Mesopotamian Homer, who contributed just as important types of literature to the world as any of the greats that followed after him. The Epic of Gilgamesh follows the king of Uruk and his friend Enkidu on a quest through various landscapes in order to find the secret of eternal life. The person who supposedly holds this secret was named Utana Pishtim. The entire story includes journeys through massive forests, across great rivers, and for many, interesting and mystical locations. Because Gilgamesh was said to be this king, there are factual historical records of his reign and life, besides the piece of literature that includes fictional events. This king, who was supposedly the son of a priest and the goddess Ninsun, or Great Holy Mother, would have made him a demigod and thus quite powerful on earth. A lot of Mesopotamian kings took on the role of deity in order to make themselves seem more powerful. This combination of godly power and mortal humbleness would have been especially interesting to the people reading or hearing the story back then. In the story itself, the king was cruel and egotistical. He did not treat the people under him with much kindness or consideration. In order to teach him humility, he sent a wild man named Enkidu to the king to challenge his power in a very physical way. The story describes how Enkidu was lured into the palace by Shamhat, a temple prostitute, and then brought before the king. There is a physical challenge, a fight that Enkidu loses, and a new bond of friendship between the two men. Gilgamesh's mother even adopts Enkidu into their family. The rest of the story includes quite a lot of other physical battles, when journeying through the cedar forest together, they come across a fierce demon named Humbaba and the Bull of Heaven, who insults Inanna and states that Enkidu must die. Because of this blood price that must be paid, Gilgamesh realizes his own mortality and the weak mortal failings of the flesh. Having lost his best friend and brother, he becomes distraught and despairs that he will die one day like Enkidu did. The quest for eternal life begins. Gilgamesh struggles through various other obstacles such as the land of night and the waters of deaths until he comes to Utana Pishtim, a man who is said to know the secrets of eternal life. He is the origin of Noah in the story from the Christian Bible about the great flood and one man being saved by building an ark. After he had told him to, Utana Pishtim constructed this massive boat and brought many animals on board to save them. This ancient immortal gives Gilgamesh various tasks to do to prove he is worthy of eternal life. The first is to stay awake for six days, but he is unable to do so. He then tells the hero to fetch a magical plant. Gilgamesh succeeds, but the plant is eaten by a snake that sneaks in during the night. After these failures, Gilgamesh is sent back home with the knowledge that there is nothing he can do to avoid tests in the future. The entire story is a teaching tale that shows how people can strive and fight against the passage of time and eventual death, but will not be able to triumph over. It is ultimately about finding your own purpose in life and the reason to journey on and overcome the challenges presented to you. The Epic of Gilgamesh is ultimately a story of failure, but it teaches a lot using allegory and symbolism that demonstrates a very rich literary form for the first heroic epic in history. People can relate to his struggles, both nearly 5,000 years ago in Mesopotamia and today. Throughout all those millennia, he has shown up in different stories and books across multiple civilizations. In this way, it seems that Gilgamesh, or the King Uruk, 
has achieved the immortality he was originally after. The Amarna Letters The Amarna Letters were inscribed on clay tablets somewhere in the 1400s BCE. The style of writing used on them was Mesopotamian-style cuneiform in the Akkadian script. Interestingly enough, these tablets were not found in the centre of Mesopotamian civilization. Instead, they were discovered by archaeologists in Tel el Amarna, a prominent city in Egypt that was the capital when Amenhotep IV was the pharaoh. This style of writing was not developed in ancient Egypt at that time. Instead, the Amarna letters show that diverse groups of people adopted this language as their own in places outside of those controlled. This is quite an interesting discovery for researchers who were studying the early formation of written language and inscription. As seems appropriate for a group of tablets called the Amarna Letters, most of them were communications to and from the Egyptian king and rulers in the other Mediterranean civilizations of the time. Not only do they include greetings and ordinary things like that, but they also hold records of myths and legends, poetry, lexical texts, and what appears to be writing lessons or even vocabulary lists. Today, the Amarna Letter tablets are scattered across the world in various museums. The discovery of these letters occurred around 1887, but there is not a definitive story about how they were found. Some of the reports contradict each other, and others seem to give credit to people who were not involved. Many of the reports are second-hand and indicate that the tablets which would become the Amarna letters were found by peasants, farmers or other commoners. They may have been discovered by private adventurers who were not associated with a particular museum or company. When archaeologists went back to Tel El Amarna to learn more about the discovery, they encountered more confusion and discrepancy. Some of the local population indicated that they were found in a so-called records office or place of the correspondence of Pharaoh. Although there are clear records that some other tablets and texts were found here, the Amarna letters were probably not at all in this location at any time. The general consensus is that not all the tablets came from one place, Instead, they were scattered about multiple official buildings in the administrative complex in this Egyptian city. The experts who have studied these cuneiform letters have found quite a lot of interesting historical evidence and information about Egypt, other Mediterranean groups, and the communication they shared. In some ways, these tablets show some of the earliest international relations in the world. They come into varieties. Most of the letters seem to come from vassals or lesser nobility in the Egyptian-controlled area. These citizen kingdoms were called the Levant. It is easy to see that the people who wrote these were very interested in paying homage to the king, as they frequently identified him as Lord and the Son. They frequently signed the letters with the words, Your Servant. As would be expected from any inter-kingdom communications, letters mostly complained about political issues nearby rulers, and trade. The smaller portion of these letters came from outside kings and rulers and were addressed to the Egyptian ruler of the smaller Levantines. In these, the kings of Assyria, Babylonia, Hatti, and Mitanni did not show deference to the pharaoh. Instead, they called him brother and spoke about mutually beneficial exchanges and trade. Some of these tablets mentioned gold, lapis lazuli, jewelry, chariots, and other valuable resources. There were even a few letters that discussed the possibility of royal marriages to bind different countries' houses together. Perhaps the most unique letter in the collection was from Ashur Ubalit I, a leader in Assyria that represents the first communication between him and the pharaoh. As would be appropriate, he also offered to fine horses and chariots, lapis lazuli, stone trinkets, and asked if he could send a messenger to visit Egypt on his behalf. Most of the requests in the letters were half practical and half promotional. The rulers wanted to establish trade and get protection from the other countries nearby, but they also wanted the benefit of raising their status because of these associations. In order to impress the recipient as much as possible, the scribes were undoubtedly told to use highly elaborate and respectful greetings, including multiple titles, honors, and wishes for good health and a long life, to both the king and his family. Although the Amarna letters are usually looked upon as historical documents that show political and economic connections 
between the ancient civilizations. Many believe they were probably read out loud to the king and the court, which would transform them from mere historical documents into ceremonial artifacts too. The appearance of some of the tablets seemed to indicate that format itself was often augmented to impress. First Egyptian writing was painted in pectoral hieroglyphics on papyrus paper. The Akkadian and Mesopotamian script was carved with wedge-shaped symbols into flat clay. Some indication of sprucing things up comes from the extra-large tablets, decorative margins, and sections of the letter that were marked off for other purposes. Although these and other changes may have simply been decorative, they may also have indicated different rulers' personal style or stamp of identification. Not only would the tablet itself make an impression on the pharaoh, but the messenger with a unique outfit and presentation style would show the quality of the person sending them and their respect and honor for the recipient. Luckily for modern researchers, the Amarna letters were stored quite safely in the records office and nearby buildings in Egypt. There were over 350 different letters in total, and they were probably saved so carefully so that the rulers could check back through the files to see who gave what gift and when, how respectful a particular Levant or foreign ruler was, and to verify requests and marriage offers. Conversely, perhaps saving these unique foreign missives was part of the status-seeking behavior of the rulers who received them. After all, if they were important enough to get dozens of cuneiform tablet letters from other important people, they are surely worthy of respect and admiration.